Some half a century ago, a very talented producer by the name of Jerry Anderson was moving on to his next marionette venture, having finished with Fireball XL5. What he moved on to next is a personal favourite of mine. When it was replayed in the 1980s, and what makes this successor to Fireball somewhat significant is that it was the first British marionette show to be shot in colour, even though it was broadcast in black and white. And also, the first marionette show where the characters had interchangeable heads. A trend that would continue into Thunderbirds. I am of course referring to Stingray, the famous deep sea diving submarine that was capable of underwater speeds of 600 knots and a surface speed of 400 knots. The year is 2065, and somewhere along the west coast of the United States of America sits Marineville that is home to the Wasps. The World Aquanaut Security Patrol, who patrol the seas keeping Marineville and anywhere else in the world safe from any hostile beings that lurk above or beneath the seas. The prized vessel of the Wasps is Stingray a Mark III vessel that only carries a crew of three and is capable of descending to 36,000 feet and having some of the most sophisticated sounding equipment known to man. Stingray has self-contained episodes with very different missions and objectives. There are three episodes linked together in the sense of that Titan is not happy with Marina no longer being his slave and does set out a plan of revenge but ultimately gets thwarted due to Troy's actions. The other being the Master Plan, which sees Titan attacking Stingray, poisoning Troy and giving Troy the antidote in exchange for Marina. The pilot establishes who the Wasps are and the purpose they serve in the story with Stingray and its crew seeking out what had happened to Sea Probe. Although this is a good episode, my main gripe is the way Stingray itself was played down. Now, I will grant that you need to surround the submarine with good supporting characters and story, but it'd be effectively having a Thunderbirds episode with only five minutes of a rescue. The series is able to have a good blend of suspense, thriller, moments of sadness and loss, and moments of triumph and humour. When you look at episodes like The Big Gun, Pink Eyes, Invisible Enemy, and A Nut for Marineville, you can really see the competent writing of how you can make really intense, chilling, and thrilling episodes of what it would be like if mankind was really up against unforeseen forces from beneath the sea. Particularly with Invisible Enemy, where Marineville is being paralysed from, as the very title suggests, an unseen foe who is practically disabling Marineville's defences piece by piece with no indication of who or what is doing it. Stingray herself is one of the many reasons why I watched this show as a kid, because there were no submarines in fiction or non-fiction that had that kind of look or movement and the idea that made it very appealing was that it could descend to depths that no submarine at that time could do. The Big Gun episode had her descending to the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean when she was following Maritimus's gunship that actually went below the ocean. I always enjoyed the launch sequence of Stingray, from Troy, Phones, and Marina descending into the craft via injector tubes, 
and then proceeding down a launch tunnel to the ocean. Stingray had two top speeds. One, its surface speed of rate 4, which was 400 knots, and its below the surface speed of rate 6, which was 600 knots, and any time she would hit rate 6, you knew a fun chase ensued from the Pink Ice episode and the Big Gun. For all intents and purposes, Marineville is a military post that is based 10 miles inland from sea and is where Stingray is launched from beneath the control tower. One of the unique features that makes Marineville good as a base is that the buildings will descend below to an underground complex in the event of an attack on the post, and the openings will close so that there are no possibilities of missiles reaching the buildings and the tower once they are safe from harm. Don Mason voiced the 22-year-old captain of Marineville's flagship vessel and Troy is very likeable. A no-nonsense leader, but at the same time very eager to learn more of undersea civilizations after meeting Marina. Troy's design is based upon a young-looking James Garner, and you can see the resemblance. And for some reason, if Tom Cruise was much younger today, he would have been ideal to play Troy, in my opinion. Troy is much a man of action as he is a strategist, in the sense that he will consider every conceivable action without having to be heavy-handed with a resolution to problems he encounters. Phones is voiced by Robert Easton, who earned the nickname of a man with a thousand voices due to his mastering of the English dialect. Robert just gave this very laid-back and relaxed tone to the Dixie Hydrophone Operator who served as his title suggests, Stingray's Hydrophone Operator. Meaning he would listen out for any friendly or enemy craft based upon the soundings he would receive in his headset. The Mute Tailless Mermaid Hi there, Marina. Marina comes from the sea, Prez. She can't talk. A silent woman, huh? <laughs> That's even better. Wow. I have no words for this. Marina is at the equivalent age of 19 years old in marine years. She is mute through a curse that Titan has placed upon her and her father, the ruler of Pacifica. The jig is, if either were to speak, Titan would destroy their underwater city. Hmm, subtle. We first meet Marina as Titan's slave in the pilot episode, and instantly sees Troy as her ticket out of Titan's grasp. She assists in Troy and Phones' escape plan and towing Stingray back to Marineville. She is added to the Stingray crew as her knowledge and experience of Under the Sea makes her an invaluable member to the crew. Considering also she was unaffected by the pressure of the depth the sub went to in The Big Gun. One. Zero. The Man Who Calls the Shots Sam Shaw had been confined to a hover chair after he is paralysed from an injury that is mentioned in Ghost of the Sea. Shaw is a very gruff, rough around the edges, no nonsense man of authority that makes quick thinking decisions for not only the Stingray crew, but for the well-being of Marineville. Sam is voiced by Ray Barrett, who also voiced Lieutenant Fisher and Titan, and later he would go on to voice John Tracy in Thunderbirds. Voiced by Lois Maxwell, who some of you may remember as Ms. Moneypenny from the earlier James Bond movies, serves as her father's lieutenant in the control tower and as the communication officer between Marineville and Stingray. Lois gave Atlanta this very bubbly, approachable and pleasant tone that just made the character very likeable. Also, I like the tone she would use when it would seem that Atlanta was competing for Troy's affections over Marina.
I felt his character was kind of filler, to the effect of, if you removed him, it would impact the story very little, or none at all. Although the only time he had any major highlight was the Rescue from the Skies episode where he was actually training to be Stingray's latest Aquanaut. The tyrannical ruler of the underwater city of Titanica. Nice to see he's not above narcissism. Titan basically wants to rid the ocean of all opposition against him and conquer the land. As his name suggests, he is a surface agent that reports any useful information back to Titan from his post on the Isle of Lemoy. The only times he really serves a purpose are in the episode's Countdown, where he poses as a doctor that claims he can get mute people to speak, which sees Marina being used as a hostage in order to try and blow Marineville up with a bomb aboard his sub, which I call the Little Guppy. And the episode Stand By For Action, where he is in the guise of a movie director making a film about Marineville and trying to eliminate Troy. Titan Stooges. They pilot Titan's warships known as either the Mechanical Fish or the Terror Fish. Depending on which media of Stingray you followed, from the TV show or to the comics, is entirely up to you of which definition you prefer. Not much is known about them except for them being able to speak English or their own native tongue, which sounds like blowing bubbles in a drink. On the commentary for the pilot episode, creator Jerry Anderson stated that the only times that Stingray was in the water was either on the surface or when it was at the start of its launch sequence being lowered into the water. The rest of the time, Stingray would be filmed in the dry behind an aquarium with fish in to give the illusion that the super sub was in the water. Which makes sense considering what extensive time in the water would do to the marionettes and the models. The music had the right tone for different situations. Whether it be humour, intense situations, and for nice uplifting moments. Also, the opening theme just gets you charged for the episode. The ending theme is cute, and it just shows the feelings and affections that Troy has for Marina. And it just shows why Barry Gray is one of the best composers. End of. Fifty years later, and Stingray is still enjoyable to many audiences. From those that saw it originally in the 60s to audiences I am a part of when it was re-screened in the 80s and 90s. Stingray was replayed in 1992 due to the new prints from the Master Negatives and the popularity of Thunderbirds gaining a new following the year beforehand. I think it's the fantasy of being able to explore the great unknown that are our very oceans and the worlds that lay beneath the light and the surface. What makes it so enjoyable is the writing, quick paced action scenes and superb vehicle modelling and a good cast of actors that gave these characters their own mannerisms and traits that you could distinguish from each other and appreciate. I do find it to be a kick in the teeth that Stingray is not as appreciated in the same vein as Captain Scarlet and Thunderbirds, as one of the few titles from Jerry Anderson's work that has yet to be reimagined or rebooted for a new age. The way the new Captain Scarlet was animated would have been perfect for Stingray, except for it not getting enough exposure. And the less I say about that Thunderbirds movie, the better. Stingray was my introduction to Jerry Anderson's work and so holds more of a soft spot for me. Here's to another 50 years in Stingray. And remember, 
Anything can happen in the next half hour.